Hey, this is Julian Light. If you are wanting to learn how to embrace change and navigate through disruption as a leader, then listen to the Leadership is Changing podcast with my good friend, Dennis Genetsos. Welcome to Leadership is Changing. Each week, we and our guests provide information and insights through exploring leading change. This is taking your leadership to another level by finding the balance between executive excellence and personal well-being through stories that inspire real change. It's time to adapt in our fast-moving world when leadership is changing with your host, Dennis Giannoutsas. Hey, welcome to the show, Leadership is Changing. What we as leaders know to be true is that change is constant. Leaders everywhere confront similar obstacles because people are people, but everywhere you go, leaders are overwhelmed, disrupted, and under pressure. They run from email to email, meeting to meeting. Many leaders are not changing quick enough, which means they run the risk of becoming irrelevant and being left behind. The purpose of the show is taking our listeners' leadership to another level by finding their balance between executive excellence and personal well-being through stories that inspire real change. I believe we don't have enough effective leaders in the world today, and if we can get the leaders to step up and lead change, they can inspire real change. Hey, listeners, it's now time to adapt in the fast-moving world, and I want to welcome you to today's session. Hey, listeners, if you haven't checked out the Facebook group or the LinkedIn page, Leadership is Changing, Go ahead and do that. A great community of leaders working together and uh, sharing ideas, which is fantastic. Hey, today's guest is Julian Light, and Julian studied politics at the University of Auckland before completing his first-class honours degree at Victoria University of Wellington. That's a wonderful city, that one. And Julian started his career in the Australian Foreign Service before serving in the national-led government as an advisor to MPs and ministers including officers of Nick Smith and Amy Adams. He was a consultant at public relations firm Acumen Republic and an external relations specialist in the financial services sector. One of his proudest moments was working in the Amy Adams team where they tackled complex social issues like family violence, homelessness and social investment. He has worked as a senior business manager at Fonterra, which is a large dairy company, where he advised New Zealand's largest company on reputational risk and business strategy in areas of global business and sustainability, and had the opportunity to work in Shanghai, London, and Hong Kong. Hey, recently, he's joined in New Zealand as an organization in crisis, where he is advising in a public relations and reputation role to help turn around the national airline. He's uh, been on many boards uh, of directorships over the years, including the Institute of Public Administration, YRAPA Cancer Society, Public Relations Institute of New Zealand and helped establish the Youth Advisory Council of the New Zealand Middle East Business Council. He's completing his MBA at the moment and has founded his own pet care startup and is an author and commentator. He's an avid runner and rower and he's engaged to his uh, fiance Jordan and uh, a doctor who is specializing in wonderful things, obstetrics, obstetrics, did I say it right? Obstetrics, yeah. Thank you, man. It's a tricky and they one. live in Auckland, and with their with their son Hugo and their dog Teddy. Yeah, it's a it's a difficult kind of word to get out there, oh, especially mate. when I'm on the flow. Julian, a massive welcome to you. Thank you, thank you for having me, Dennis. Yes, hey, um, I've shared a little bit about your background there and an impressive uh, sort of lineup that you've got there. And tell me something. Tell me more about your background. Is there anything else you'd like to share? Well, no, I think it's it's strange actually sitting here um, having you read back my life because I was sort of like, oh, some of those things sound all right. <laughs> you always sort of forget about them. You know, when they you're sound quite them. good. Yeah, they yeah. do. So, no, uh, look, yeah, and I'm a self-confessed political junkie. You know, I think you can kind of hear that from some of the sorts of things you read out. But, you know, I'm a, I was talking to someone the other day and they sort of said, what do you do? And I sort of said, oh, look, I'm a, I'm a reputation mechanic. I like getting cool. under the hood of you know, businesses and organizations and kind of trying to work out, A, what's working, what's not, and then, you know, fiddling with the thing, a few things here and there and getting things humming again. And I've had I've had the privilege of working for some pretty awesome people and organizations and companies throughout the years. Um, yeah, so. Well, what, what makes you, what inspires you or makes you so motivated about the the kind of role as a reputation mechanic? What do you like about it so much? You know what? I think it's just the fact that there's something's come undone 
along the way. You know, I've always enjoyed my career working for, I wouldn't say organizations in crisis, because that's sometimes an overdone word, but certainly organizations that have needed a bit of fine tuning. And, you know, I've, I think, you know, given my, my father's a builder, you know, I'm a big DIY addict. So I think just the, the, the idea of of tackling something and fixing something, I think is probably in my DNA and it's just, you know, translated into my professional life. But, you know, just rolling up your sleeves and, and, and fixing something for the better is always pretty satisfying. Yeah, rolling up your sleeves and fixing something. And I think that's really quite important in a leadership role is to roll up your sleeves and get in there and maybe not fix things, but at least lead from the front, depending on what needs to happen. So how did you get into leadership? Yeah, look, I feel like a bit of a fraud talking about leadership, uh, to be honest, because you know I feel like I've stood behind, certainly in the shadow of some great leaders, you know, from some politicians, um, prime ministers, ministers, and the like, uh, to CEOs of some you know pretty large, complex New Zealand businesses. But I certainly don't feel qualified to talk about it because I feel, in some ways, that I have fallen into leadership roles, and and you know certainly you know we'll unpick what leadership means, and I think leadership. What, what used to be leadership has certainly transformed over the years. But I, I feel like I've just sort of assumed leadership roles without realizing it. I, I looked back at my sort of career and, and CV and the like, trying to find a moment where I went from managing people to leading people and mm. couldn't f- quite find that. I was hoping for a distinctive moment uh, that I could talk to, but haven't. And I think that's the very, very nature of leadership today is that it's no longer about title or you know having a a c-suite office it's about having the opportunities to sort of step up and and lead people around you even though you may not know you're doing it so uh, for me it's been a i suppose a bit of a journey still on it yeah cool and when you i I really like what you say there julian in relation to managing people to leading people i think that's quite a good sort of segue into certain things as well for a lot of leaders and Mm -hmm. um you know, I think a lot of them do manage and, you know, whereby I think what we used to say was that management comes from the head and leadership comes from the heart. Yeah, that's right. And, yeah, so, uh, yeah. Hey, look, I'm going to ask you a question here. Now, this person can be alive or from history. And the question here is, who's your favorite leader and why? Yeah, I don't really have a single leader. I think leaders and leadership changes so often, right? And, and, and depending on the circumstance. So every year I tend to focus or, or sort of, I guess, study a, a leader uh, to keep up with the times and, and make sure, you know, sort of you're constantly learning and, and um, understanding business and political world around us. And this year I'm, I'm studying, studying, I'm reading all about Satya Nadella, who's the CEO of Microsoft, a chap who took over the reins of one of the most iconic companies, which had a world-famous CEO. Everyone knew who who Bill Gates is. No one knows who Nadella is, or very few people do, certainly not a household name. And yet he revolutionized the way that company operated. He really, he humanized a technology giant. I mean, that that is in itself is a huge um, sort of accomplishment. You know, he focused on culture and empathy and um, he was a very, he's a very curious leader and he sort of assumed this role. No one really had heard much about him and he completely defied expectations. And I think a lot of people read about him and certainly my reflection is that he's, people think, oh, well, he's an empathetic leader. So therefore he's a soft leader or he was just a really nice guy or is a nice guy. But actually he brought great clarity uh, to his vision had really big, bold ideas, very innovative, and he's very energetic. So he brings to, you know, any meeting or any sort of engagement he has one-on-one or with, you know, 5,000 people, he's and he brings this great energy and urgency and momentum to his ideas. And, you know, he's been incredibly successful. You know, I think he grew Microsoft by something like $250 billion, which is a nice, tidy little sum for someone, you know, but, but really did it in a way that changed the culture. And I think mm. he's, a, he's a leader for our times, really. So I've got a lot more to learn about him, but that's certainly what has impressed me so far. Yeah, I had the privilege of going with Microsoft, uh, 30 facilitators from around the world. We all went to Microsoft in Dublin, and we were talking about exactly what you're just talking about, because he wanted the, the leaders to come up with their own purpose in life. Yeah, that's right. And so we've seen that quite a bit as well, which is, which mm. is fantastic. But I love what you say here about bring energy, urgency, and momentum 
to the role and to to th- and to meetings and things like that. So I think that that'll be brilliant. Now, you being a reputation mechanic, here I am. I'm, I'm getting nervous. I'm about to ask you a question here. So I want to know <laughs> a little bit more about what your thoughts are on this. And the title of the show is called Leadership is Changing. What does that mean for you? Yeah, look, I think, I mean, obviously, I well, I think it's a little bit obvious, but there's been this huge change in leadership, right, in terms of what it means, what it stands for, who who we would typically call a leader has changed so massively. And I think certainly in the last 10 years or more, it has changed quite dramatically. I think, you know, I sort of started off my career, it must have been sort of 2007 odd. Social media was sort of just coming into its early days. So I feel like I've been sort of part of this transition generation where, you know, I'm a millennial. So I've seen what the old sort of way of leading and managing used to be like. And I've seen this huge disruption come in and shift away from formal titles or position to this sort of almost kind of like a mana, right, sort of role. You know, being a manager used to make you automatically a leader, but it doesn't today. And I think technology's obviously had a huge impact on that. You know, you don't need to be a CEO or a senior executive with a C-suite off a corner office to show leadership. You know, you can be a 15-year-old and campaigning about climate change and you are showing more leadership than, you know, someone at the very top of a um, listed company can be. So I think the, 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 the very um, confines of what defines a leader has changed incredibly. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a millennial, as I said, and so I'm heavily influenced by my generation. I think millennials will be the biggest proportion of the workforce within a decade or so. And so how millennials are sort of looking and approaching leadership is so different because we are sort of the digital natives, right? Dig- uh, Facebook, social media, technology, has all consumed us and we've really taken it and adapted it to the way that we work. You know, we want a, a sort of a flatter, faster, more sort of more focused on fairness in the way of doing things. And it's a very far cry from the very regimented environments that have long def- defined workplaces, you know, where employees have had little to no flexibility, you know, must do what they're told. And that division between my personal self and my professional self that no longer, a lot of those things no longer exist. And, you know, we're really, I think it was, I read it in Forbes that said authoritarian leadership is out and inclusive leadership is in. And I think inclusive leadership for me doesn't just mean accepting a range of views. It's about it's about actively seeking them out and creating an environment where everyone has the opportunity, to, you know, to share their voice regardless of where they are in an organisation. I think... Um, a lot of the time, certainly in my younger years, only good ideas came from the top. And, you know, they were the decision makers, you know, they had earned their stripes. And yet now some of the best ideas come from, you know, the, the, the you know, 20 year old grad who's, you know, been in the business six months because they're looking at something from a completely different perspective and they can shape up a, and, and freshen up an organization and show leadership very much so. Uh, so you don't need, to have the formal position anymore. And I know I'm talking to a man who knows, you know, you're, you're agreeing with me, but there has been that, I think, in, in my career, I've been very fortunate to really to see that transition happen and be shaped by it. Yeah, and I think that's not going to be the only transition that we'll see. We'll probably see more in the future as well, which exactly. which we'll talk about a little bit later on. But yeah, it's some very good points. And, uh, you know, the other thing here that you said, authentic leadership is out and inclusive leadership is in. It's that collaboration. It's the ability to be able to collaborate well together. You know, so many organizations work in silos. I'm going to protect my little patch and look after my little team and that. And that just does not going to count or it's not going to even, you know, work nowadays. You're going to have to work and collaborate with others as well. Otherwise, you're going to be very lonely and your organization is not going to go very far at all. Yeah, and you're going to lose out on some big ideas as well. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, you're right. I mean, there there will be some big ideas or... You know, so limited to your own thinking, whereby if you have a team of people and you can get so many more ideas, fantastic. So the question here it could be around your business or industry, but I actually would, you know, you may even, you know, you may want to think about your kind of thing around communication and marketing or, you know, that type of scenario, maybe more communication. How has your business or industry changed and what demands does that put on you? Yeah, well, I think communications has changed. Well, I mean, it's done a complete 
turnaround. I mean, technology, internet, the availability, the accessibility of knowledge at everyone's fingertips has created a whole lot of experts and certainly brought down a whole lot of barriers to you know, not just uh, in, a, in a workplace or in a, in a business environment, but in, you know, on societal level, on a political level, you know, and that's certainly changed the way that any leader, you know, wants to engage or communicate, you know, there's that sort of term in politics, the soapbox, you know, you used to get on top of a literally, it was used to be a soapbox and stand in the street and pontificate. And now, uh, I, you know, I, I suppose some politicians probably still do, but certainly the more effective one, it's a dialogue, it's a conversation, right? It's not going to be a one-way flow of, you know, what they see in the world. And, you know, I think just the advent of technology has just meant that, you know, our worlds are so bigger, uh, so much wider, and that knowledge and perspectives can be easily picked up. So, and I think one of the big the big changes that I've seen from a from a, 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 I suppose a communications perspective has been sort of the advent of, and, and we touched on this earlier, uh, purpose led organisations. So you know, um, and I think that's I'd like to claim that as for, for my generation that millennials have come in and sort of said, look, we're younger, we're sort of more, we're driven by you know wanting to get things done absolutely, but to make make our our small contribution part of something much bigger than us. And you know, if I was reflecting on you know Nadella and some of his successes, he certainly brought that purpose led. Everyone to you know you sort of turn up, he used to turn up to the I think he asked the person on the front desk, the receptionist or whatever, and said, you know, what do you do here? And they said, oh we're here to make Microsoft the best company we can be, you know, and it was like that's the it wasn't to answer the phone or ushering guests. That person felt like they had as important contribution to make to that business as he did. And so it's all about, yeah, yeah. And, I, you know, I was reading something that said, I think it was about nine out of 10 millennials are happy to earn less in their role, in their job, if they are able to make a meaningful contribution uh, to their job. And I think that's a pretty telling sign that, organizations no longer can just be about fulfill your job description you know do whatever it is that we've hired you to do people want more from their employment from their jobs from their social clubs from their community groups from their politicians and they want to be able to contribute and be part of something bigger and i think that's certainly something that has been a huge change so julian if i was to turn around and say that you know with the millennials and that you brought up that topic a few times here which is which is brilliant to hear because well, where where I want to go with this is just ask you, if I was a leader today and I had millennials coming on board with me or that, well, what's one or two things I should be thinking about as a leader in helping these millennials find that purpose or work on that purpose or be part of a team that has a bigger purpose? What are, what are one or two things you think they might need to work on? Yeah, well, I'd say the f- the first thing is, and I'm I'm no expert on millennials. I'm just, I suppose I'm speaking as as one, but one of many, is um, we love to overshare. And so I think it's I think it's the advent of, of social media, right? We've just grown up sharing things on, on, on social media. And so there isn't really a difference between our personal life and professional life anymore. And, and we look to leaders to be very authentic and their real selves as well. You, you can sort of there's nowhere to hide anymore. You can't really be inauthentic. People can spot a fake pretty quickly. And I think there's, and sometimes it's an unfair expectation on uh, on other leaders, but we certainly expect them to share their personal life and that blur that line between work and what they do in the weekends. And I think it's it's just part of that turning up to work you know, and speaking to a work you know, example is no longer just about earning something, earning a check, and and having a form of employment. It's really about that greater purpose, and we so therefore look to, you know, our managers and our our, our senior leaders to be more than just good at what they do. We want to see their whole self and their whole person. So if you are looking at bringing on younger a younger generation, I would they will want to to get to know you and to really understand what makes you tick at home. You know, at church um, in the community as much as what makes you tick in the boardroom. Yeah, brilliant. And I, I like it because the fact is that they do want to know team and millennials are hungry as uh, as Gillian was saying before, they want to get things done. 
they want to make things happen and they do want to be part of something that's bigger than them, which is great. And I, you know, the the line between personal and professional, as you're saying, it's all now going into one. But people just want leaders to be uh, vulnerable, human, sure. have yeah. the humility, and be relatable. I think yeah. it's probably another way of putting it, right? So um, yeah. Yeah, and you'd yeah. be really surprised about what relatable means. It doesn't mean you have to be a superstar. Like, you know, there's a real trend at the moment against the people who can, the superstars, the people who can do it all. There's a real, you know, and kind of come out looking polished and perfect and amazing because I think we're all very insecure about, you know, whether we're meeting the mark or, or doing, you know, it, celebrities and Instagrammers seem to have this amazing life uh, and we just can't quite get it but there's a real push against that and it's now towards the vulnerable and and showing a bit of authenticity and saying actually I can't do it all I'm struggling I'm stressed we're having more conversations about mental health and the like so I think people are are really shifting towards a much more sort of open and, and very sort of real expectation of leadership as well. Yeah, and I, and I know that you brought up just now mental health because I think for a lot of younger people, there is a lot of mental health. And if you are going through that, uh, listeners, if you're one of these people who are going through some mental health and that, go and get the whole right help. Like we encourage you to go and find the right people to talk to for sure. And I think that's that's really, really important that they do that. Absolutely. Hey, if there was one thing you could change a business as a leader today, what would that be? Oh, there would be so many. <laughs> Do I only get one? No, no. Well, it's um, up to you, but um, yeah. Uh, yeah, look, I think the one thing I would would be probably top of my wish list uh, would be uh, have brave conversations. You know, I think leaders today, and again, this is a massive generalization, but there certainly are a lot of fast followers, but there aren't that many pioneers. And if you think about you know, the way I, I, I the, the leaders who inspire me are the ones that are, you know, really going out there and, and having an opinion on something, having a view, believing in something. You, you may not necessarily agree with it. I think there's a, a real element of respect and admiration for people. And I think, you know, organizations are, are quite terrified of saying mm. something wrong. And, you know, I see it every day. But the cost of that is that there's very little safe space for bold or new ideas. And, the, you know, the, I, there's few, few, fewer and fewer leaders rising to the challenge uh, and taking on, you know, even ideas around, you, know, you, you might be a business leader, but you, you can form a view about politics or you can form a view about society or climate change or whatever it is. Diversity means you know diversity of ideas and thinking as much as it does about you know gender or identity or anything like that so i would i would want bolder conversations uh not just in the boardroom as well around the water cooler and things like that yep so have brave conversations and you know we have a lot of followers and not many pioneers i like that one for sure so listeners i'm here with julian light he is a reputation mechanic and he shared with us already about millennials and also about what employees are expecting. So I, my next question is about, and I, I think you've already covered this, but is there anything else you want to add in relation to how has employees' expectations of leaders changed? Anything else you want to add to that, Julian? Well, yeah, I mean, just to double down, really, and still, you know, really reinforce how how it's entirely flipped. Vulnerability is in, you know, and it's those sort of, I've represented and worked for a number of organizations that have been quite closed off, you know, that sort of fortress mentality and, and, and that's not going to work today. I think people are looking for, particularly employees building on that, that purpose led um, mission. You know, they are, they are increasingly looking for something bigger than themselves, you know, mission, trust and value in their work lives. And I think, yeah, leaders today and need to look for you know they need to be building a 21st century career, you know, so improving reward systems, focusing on employee well-being, addressing some of those big meaty human capital issues. You know, we're living in a world of well, it's tremendous economic growth. Maybe not so much lately, but certainly up until COVID, and a huge technological revolution, and yet also one of huge income inequality, contentious debate around nationalism, uh, lots of concerns around diversity and inclusion and fairness and identity at work. And I think leaders need to address these in very integrated and very strategic ways. And that's a, and that's a big challenge, right, for any leader. But how, how they can shape their organization 
to be responsible and caring to society today while providing livelihoods and, and, and delivering on the bottom line, that would be a good start, I think. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. Yeah, great. So leaders, focus on building a 21st century career. That is, that's awesome. And Julian, in this fast-paced, ever-changing world, we've got so much happening day in, day out. As I say in my introduction, going from email to email, meeting to meeting, many leaders are not changing quick enough, which they run the risk of being relevant, becoming irrelevant, being left behind. What makes a leader successful in today's fast-paced, ever-changing world? Yeah. Well, I think that the list of, you know, these, we're talking in a meeting earlier today about, you know, bringing on this new platform at work. And someone said, look, that's all good and well and good. We'll bring in something new, but we need to stop a few things as well. And I actually think that's, I sort of thought, oh, I'll use that later because your leadership cha- uh, traits are changing. Leadership is changing and therefore leadership traits are changing, right? And sometimes though, it's about stopping as much as starting. And, you know, I was thinking about you know, resilience in today's world. It's time for leaders to gear up and, you know, increase their stamina and build resilience, particularly during something like, like COVID. But building resilience means also, you know, stop the sort of the macho I need to be perfect I need to be 100% all the time you can be vulnerable and open with your teams Uh, so it's about sort of stopping those behaviors that no longer work as well as embracing you know the ones that will learning from uh, people like Nadella certainly leading from behind you know, no longer do you have to be out with the, the raising the flag. Of course, you want to be proud and have your name out there and be don't be ashamed about it. But certainly, I don't think you need to be, you know, have that, that title or that position in any organization to be able to lead. Other things I think leaders need to be successful in an ever-changing world would be a curiosity, be a mm. lifelong learner. That's an awesome word, that curiosity, eh? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. I certainly because the, if you, if you think about it, curiosity, I think became I, I, maybe it was just in the circles I was in, but but certainly kind of like oh, you know, curiosity killed the cat. It don't look, don't explore, don't investigate, don't be too um, open minded about things. And I think actually in today's world, being curious is one of the best things uh, that you can be because you know you might find an answer that you didn't even know you had a question to. And, 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 you know, you mentioned it before collaboration, and I think that's part of it, you know, appreciating that you don't need to know everything, that you can go out there and ask and, and, and not be expected to be the expert on everything. And I think collaboration is a really great way to bring insight and skill and expertise and to an organization just by being curious and asking the question and, you know, working together. But certainly a true leader, in my view, looks beyond today's challenges and and challenges people to keep an eye on the horizon and always looking ahead. What a great segue into the next question, which is about the horizon and looking at the, where things are going. So the question here, Julian, is if I was to get your crystal ball out and ask you to think about the future, where, where do you see leadership being in five years? Well, my guess is as good as any anyone else's. I think there were a lot of a lot of views about the future pre COVID nineteen that have um, have changed pretty dramatically. But I was reading something the other day that said, uh, and it was beautiful, so I'm going to steal it. Crisis doesn't build character; uh, it reveals it. And I think COVID was a wonderful. I mean, it's been a terrible thing for so many people. I don't. I'm not going to try and spin it, but it certainly. The, uh, the uh, sort of an upside, I guess, was that the tide went out very quickly and exposed a lot of really poor leaders. And and so I look to COVID-19 being this big disruptive transformational change on, on, on a global level. I mean, it really only happens sort of once in a generation. Um, but I really think it will transform leaders and, and how exactly, I suppose, we'll have to see. But certainly for me, you know, around flexibility, around communication, engagement, I don't think there's such a thing as over communicating anymore and building trust and, and working on that shared purpose, which we've mentioned a couple of times. I think those are the sorts of things that we're going to see a lot more of in the years to come. Oh, brilliant. Julian, crisis doesn't build character, it reveals it. And if you think about a tsunami, listeners, where a tsunami coming in, the water goes on out and it reveals the fish and everyone's going, oh, what's going on here? And the next minute the waves will come in. And uh, so it's a great example that he's giving us there. Um, so crisis doesn't build character, it reveals it. Julian, hey, thank you for joining us on today's show. If our listeners are wanting to get hold of you, where should they go? 
Oh, find me on LinkedIn. Drop me a line. Anytime. Excellent. So, thank you. Yeah, that's great. So once again, thank you for joining us on the show today. It was a real pleasure in talking to you about today's thank topic you. of leadership is changing. Thank you. Hey, listeners, what we as leaders know to be true is that change is constant. Change is incredibly scary, especially with the unknown and the unfamiliar territory. It's time to adapt in our fast-moving world when leadership is changing. Hey, look out for the episodes as they've been released. Download them, have a listen, put a review and a rating. Feel free to share them with your friends, your family, your network. Hey, if there's any feedback you'd like to give me on the show, or if there's a question you have for my guests as I interview them, or if you have a question for the Ask Dennis Freestyle episode, feel free to send me an email, dennis at leadingchangepartners.com. If you haven't checked out the Facebook group or the LinkedIn page, Leadership is Changing, we'd love to see you there. Hey, listeners, thanks for tuning in today, and until next time, bye for now. Thank you for listening to this episode of Leadership is Changing with your host, Dennis Giannoutsas. Each week, we and our guests provide information and insights through exploring leading change, inspiring executives and leaders to adapt and lead a bigger game in a fast-moving world.